you've got the, the, the origins, the beginnings of rockabilly, and Scotty Moore, who played uh, lead guitar on those tracks, he is the father of rockabilly, and um, and and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll start off with that one, and then we'll we'll see where we go from there. And uh, you can hear this wonderful buzzing sound. This that actually comes free with the guitar, which uh, I think is a wonderful addition. So let's see where we go. Shaking that was going on up here just <laughs> destroyed the music. <laughs> is it is it broken? Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> well, we 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 may be uh, short of some backing uh, tracks now, but not to worry, not to worry. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hopefully, this is Leo, who's done a wonderful job with the sound tonight. Give Leo a round of applause. Oh, it's still working. Obviously, the floor here in uh, Dingles is uh, very bounce-friendly. I'll play a track from now on. Thank you. Okay. So that was a bit of Scotty Moore then, anyway. And I think, you know, as a singer, a guitarist, um, that's a lovely song to be able to play because it's very, uh, you can put in some of the, the picking style. Which is very, I wouldn't say easy to do, but it comes natural to me anyway to be able to sing and play that at the same time. The next song is um, a song that I wrote, and it's kind of... Uh, a tribute, if you like, to uh, Johnny Burnett and and his style of playing and his, st his style of rockabilly. So uh, this is a song called Dark Haired Woman, which I recorded with a band called Cat Men, which featured Slim Jim Phantom on drums from the Stray Cats, yeah. who uh, I believe is here in London as I speak. So uh, let's see if we can get that one working and we'll, uh, I'll play along to that one hopefully. Two, a one, two, three. Dark air, one, one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next song is uh, again, it's, a, it's another tribute song, but it's a kind of a more of an obvious one. I wrote this song uh, many years ago, and again, it was on a Catman uh, CD, and it's, it's a song called Jumping with Gene, and it's a it's a tribute to Gene Vincent who has always been one of my idols. I remember when I first heard Gene Vincent's music when I was, I don't know, seven or eight years old, and it frightened the living daylights out of me. And I think good, good rock and roll, good rockabilly should do that to seven-year-old children. And uh, so, so uh, always been a big fan of Gene Vincent. But even then, even, even as a seven-year-old, I could tell the difference between the, the, the different guitar players that he had. And, and the guitar player that I loved, and have grown to love as I've got older, is a fellow called Cliff Gallup, who played on um, the first 35 recordings with Gene Vincent. And his playing, his style of playing was so beautiful, so fluid, uh, so clever. And, and he's a guitar player that is um, deeply loved on the rockabilly scene and outside of it as well, because as all of you will know, I'm sure Jeff Beck is a, a huge fan of his. As is a lot of guitar players from outside of the rockabilly scene that have heard Gene Vincent's music and recognised the brilliance of the musicians that played on because it wasn't just Cliff Gap, there was great musicians on that, on those records. So um, this is a song that I wrote and it's kind of a, uh, just a chance really to play in a sort of a Cliff Gallup type style. I'm not really somebody that learns somebody's style and plays it note for note. I'm not really very good at doing things like that. So I just take little bits that I like and, and I kind of add them to, to, to what I can do, which I think we, we all do. Um, and so anyway, I don't play exactly like Cliff Gallup, but um, here's a song that where I throw in as much of it as I, as I know. One, two, one, two, three. Thank you very much.
was looking around for my drink, but apparently that fell off at the same time as the, the CD player. So, uh, if I could have a lime and water, that'd be wonderful. It's very rock and roll, I know. <laughs> lime and water would do the trick. Now, I'm going to move on to the next, the last two songs I'm going to play in this set, and then I'm going to sit down and we'll have a bit of a chat. But um, the next two songs um, are Eddie Cochran songs. Now, hopefully there's some Eddie Cochran fans out there. Well, I hope you still are after these next two songs. <laughs> but I'm going to do, uh, I don't do many instrumentals, not for any particular reason, but, uh, uh, it, but it's very difficult to find instrumentals that work in a rock and roll club, you know, um, because you want it to be danceable, you want people to have a, a good time. Oh, thank you, ever so much. That's Sam, ladies and gentlemen. Just Sam, just Sam right <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, I've, I've grown up with Eddie Cochran, really. He was the first artist that, that, that I mean, Elvis was the first, first artist that I remember hearing and, and being profoundly affected by, but there was something about Eddie Cochran, he went a little bit deeper and, and, and it started an obsession which continues to this day. And uh, down to the guitars I play and the pickups I use and everything, it's all, it's all down to Eddie Cochran. So I always feel, in every gig I ever do that, you know, I want to do a couple of his songs. Sometimes, you know, we do a lot of his songs, but it's just because I'm a fan of, of this music, first and foremost, which is which goes beyond, you know, being a musician or, or whatever else I do. It's, it's all about loving this music and trying to keep it alive the best way that we, we can, you know, because I think it's terribly important that we keep this alive and we remember people like Eddie Cochran and, and Gene Vincent. So the, the, the next song is a song called Scratching, which, he, he recorded um, in 1958, and it was on the B-side of a song called I Hate Rabbits. <laughs> so, uh, you can probably tell why I didn't do very well, but Scratching is a wonderful instrumental, and I, I always think it's one of the first, um, almost like surf type um, instrumentals. Maybe when you hear it, you'll think, well, you're crazy, it's nothing like surf. But I mean, to me, I don't know anything about surf music, so probably why I think that. But um, it, it's a great rock and roll song, and I've always loved playing it. So I'm going to take a slurp of this, and then we'll have a go at it. Thank you very much. Good scratching. Okay, the next song is my favourite rock and roll song that has ever been written or recorded. And it's a song called Something Else. Yay. Uh, <laughs> a song that Eddie wrote for Sid Vicious, I always like to say. <laughs> you can kind of see where the punk thing came from, can't you, when you hear something else? I remember hearing it recently on uh, Radio 2 when I was in the car. And um, I can't remember who was playing it, but the DJ was sort of talking over it. It was very annoying, really, and I felt like writing a letter to him, but I didn't. But, uh, but anyway, I put, I put it on really loud, and it's incredible. It's such a powerful record. It's, it really is astonishing that they was able to capture that power back then in 1958, and all these years later, we've got subwoofers, and God knows, I've got a subwoofer under the, car, under the seat of my car. It's quite a nice thing, really, sometimes, when you play the music very loud. But, it was it was uh, incredible how powerful it was. So um, let's uh, have a go at this one, Leah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to sit down and we can have a chat. How does that sound? <laughs> We'll start. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Don't often get to do this on a gig, sit down, but well, you can, but you won't get paid. <laughs> so if there's anyone that has got any questions, do let me know. Thank you, Daryl. Daryl, it's about songwriting, actually, and I was just wondering how easy or difficult is it for you to stick within the genre but come up with something that's original? That's a very good question. Um, it's very difficult. I remember seeing a, uh, or, or hearing an interview with Brian Setzer once, and he was saying that um, songwriting is like running uphill. 
you know, and, and when you get to the top, you think, oh, this is great, you know, I've only got here and I've finished the song. And then you play it and, and someone says, oh, that sounds like Blueberry Hill, you know. <laughs> and you, you think, oh, yes, yeah, so it does. <laughs> and, uh, I remember on, on the first, on the very first solo album I did, which I think only about four people bought, um, I wrote a song on there called Like a, like a Brand New Man. And I remember feeling very proud of myself of that song because I thought, well, this is really catchy, you know, it's, it's really catchy. It's one of those songs that you feel like you've heard before. And the reason being is because it was a, almost a, a, a carbon copy of a Johnny Horton song um, called uh, Honky Tonk Harwood Floor. And I thought, oh, well, that's why I've heard it before. So uh, it's very difficult to write songs that, especially if you're just sticking within sort of like the three chord uh, thing, which is what we, we do with rock and roll. But um, I think the way you can make it a little bit different is if you, it's, it's the lyrics. And if you make the lyrics contemporary or about things that we all share, that we all understand. I mean, I tend to write songs about love and, and you know, it's either fallen in love or fallen out of love and all the various little avenues that go off of those two roads, really. But, you know, if you write about it in a way that, you know, everyone can understand, then, then it doesn't really matter what the music's like because it's the lyrics that resonate, I think. Um, but then, again, there's nothing wrong with Big Bopalula or, 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 or Tutti Frutti or songs like that, is there? So, I mean, I think there's room for everything, but it is very difficult to write songs. It's not something I particularly enjoy, but I'm one of these people that will say, right, I'm going to go into the studio tomorrow and I'm going to write four songs, and I'll go in there and I'll write four songs, but I won't have any idea of what they're going to be about. You know, it's just, you just sit in there and you do it. And, and I mean, I've worked with other people that... that a little, and they would say that they would say that themselves, but they're they're a little bit away with the fairies, and they have to you know, the stars have to be in in alignment, and uh, you know there, there has to be something going on in their life for them to write about it. Well, I don't I don't write songs like that. I think you, know, you can write you can either write a song or you can't. And, and if you can write a song, you can sit down and write it um, almost to order, or, 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 as uh, some people can. So, um, but I think it's just trying to make the lyrics work because if you write songs about Cadillacs and blonde haired women and things like that which I've done then you know it's, it's not going to not many people outside of the scene or the music are going to understand it so I think it's, it's really down to the lyrics thank you very much thank you Darryl, you've got to be a Gretsch <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. yes well no. No, I, now I do, and I feel quite strongly about this. Now, with me, it's a lot of it is image, and it comes down to Eddie Cochran because that's when I grew up, and I, when, I, well, when I first heard Eddie Cochran and saw Eddie Cochran, I fell in love with the guitar, and to me, that I put that guitar on a pedestal, and I wanted to, to one day be able to own a guitar like that, but not just own it, but just but be able to justify it. You see. Um, and and cause it's all well and good having a you know a three thousand pound guitar, but if you can't play it, it's no good, is it? So so you know I bought a Gretsch when I was about nineteen, and I wasn't a very good player, but it made me want to be a good player. So I practiced and practiced and practiced. But it could have been anything, you know. If Eddie Cochran had been playing a a Gibson or whatever, it it, it was what ma mattered to me at the time, and it stayed with me. I mean, I love Gretsch guitars. But you know, I'm a musician and, and I'm practical, and there's been times in my career when I haven't had, I haven't had the money to play a Gretsch. You know, so so I'll, I'll play whatever. You know, I mean, you know, I'll make it work somehow. But I feel very comfortable with a Gretsch. I think, you know, a lot about being a musician is is almost the same as being a a, um, a sportsman. Right? You know, playing sports. I mean, you know, back in the days when Steve Davis used to win all the snooker tournaments, I used to watch him and think, my God, no one could ever beat him. He's incredible, you know. And Eric Bristow, when he played dance, you know, and then later on, Steve Andrew, when he started playing snooker, you just used to watch someone like that and think, how can they ever lose? They're so brilliant. But a lot of it is all down to confidence, you know, and, it's, it, and if you're confident, then you'll do all right. And it doesn't really matter what you're playing or, or you know, where you're playing. If you're confident, you'll do a good job. Uh, and, and, and you'll come off stage and you'll feel good about what you've done. And with me, I think, you know, I feel a little bit more confident when I've got a guitar like this. It just feels right for me. It makes me feel better about what I'm doing. 
I just feel that it's a guitar that I just pick up, plug it in, and doesn't matter where I'm playing in the world or what amplifiers they've provided for me, at least I know I've got that, you know, and that gives me a bit of confidence. So, um, and I, I felt that way about, you know, the Rockingham's that I played, you know, when I was, when, when, when I helped design them for PV. I, I loved those guitars and I played them until such a time as they weren't making them anymore. So, it doesn't have to be a Gretsch. I think it's whatever you feel comfortable with, but it's whatever makes you feel confident and makes you feel, gives you that confidence and makes you feel good when you're on stage. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question here. This is my first rockabilly thing, right? And I've never seen a rockabilly guitarist before. I'm a, I love guitar player, but you have guitar myself, but you're a great guitarist. What I'm interested to know is, because when I watch you play guitar, I think I mean, you could play any genre of guitar if you wanted. Because right? you're a very talented person. So when you decide what to do or who to play with or what to write, I mean, do you just do you think wide or do you just think rockabilly is my thing? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 again, being practical. I always feel you've got to play to your strengths. Well, that's what I feel I have to do. And I know Rockabilly, I've grown up with it. It's the music that when I first heard it, it made such an impression on me. It stayed with me throughout my entire life. No other form of music has ever done that to me. You know, um, I wish I was somebody who was perhaps, I wouldn't say open-minded, because I think I am open-minded. Certainly within, because I love all, all types of, um, you know, 50s music uh, from the pop, music of the time to, to country and blues and all the other different types of music but rockabilly was, was always my thing and, and, and I think you know you, you get to a point in life where you just think well I'm going to stick with it you know because even if I don't get anywhere with it at least I will be able to uh, there will come, a, will, will come a time when people say well you know he stuck with it so you know Got to give him credit for that, you know. Even if you can't get anywhere with it, you know. <laughs> and I was a big believer. Now, now I got but relatively lucky because I, I was married to somebody who was a tremendous talent, incredible talent, you know. And 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 I think really, it took me a while to realise it, but once I did, and I threw myself into her career. Um, because I really believed in it, and I'm glad I did, because it was the best thing I ever did. Um, so I stopped everything I was doing, you know. And I knew that that she wasn't a rockabilly singer, or she was, but she loved a bit of rockabilly, as she loved lots of other different types of music. And initially, I struggled a lot in, when I first started working in her band, because all of a sudden I had to play a bit of jazz and a bit of blues and a bit of this and a bit of that, and I thought, my God. You know, I didn't know they were these other types of music. Really. <laughs> but um, I, so I, I sat down and I tried to learn as much as what I could just to get out of the the, the mess that I got myself into, really. But but it, it but but eventually it started to work and it became a, a really good band and we well, I think we made some great records and I'm very proud of it. Um, uh, but. Um, I have always played to my strengths. I don't want to go outside of it because I don't see the point. I really don't see the point. Not for me personally, but I, I admire musicians that can go from lots of different types of music. But sometimes I think it's better to be, I, want, I don't like the word master, but you know, jack of all trades, master of none, that kind of a thing, you know? But I would much rather be good at something than, than just be, you know, okay. Very much. Right, you're brilliant. Well, I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, it's a great question. My first guitar. Well, my first guitar was a Spanish guitar that my dad bought me when I was about seven or eight. It wasn't long after I first heard Eddie Cochran's music, and I pestered my dad to buy buy me a guitar, so he did. And I think um, the very same night, I, I got a green felt tip pen. I don't know why I got a green one, but I got a green felt tip pen and I drew f holes on it. Um, <laughs> And a, a G brand, uh, Bigsby, and, uh, and I, I got a 
a couple of safety pins or a couple of drawing pins or something, and I pinned one in each end and got a bit of string. And I just sort of stood in front of the mirror and played Eddie Cochran records and pretended I was Eddie Cochran. <laughs> and, and so he went off the idea of buying me a guitar a couple of years later when I really wanted to play, actually, you know. And he said, no, he said, if you want a, if you want a guitar, you've got, you've got to earn it, you know, you've got to go and buy it yourself. So he gave me a little job because he had a, his own office cleaning uh, firm. So I started doing some office cleaning for him after work. And eventually I had enough money. And there was a friend of mine, my best friend is a guy called Joe Chapman. And he lived in a, in a, um, a mobile home just down the road from this little village that I grew up in. And Joe was like, he was like Elvis to me, you know, he had this great record collection. He looked like Elvis, he could sing, he could dance, he had this pink and black Ford console which I loved, I thought it was the greatest car in the world. And Joe had a collection of electric guitars, and one of them was um, like a, I don't even know what make it was, but it was kind of like a, a 60s budget Strat. You know, it had all of these knobs and, and switches on it. I mean, I don't think anyone knew what they did, but and I certainly never knew what they did, but, but anyway, he, so he, he sold me this guitar at an amp that came with it, and it was a big, oblong thing it was a horrible looking amp anyway he sold it to me and um for 50 quid i remember and uh this was probably about 1981 or 82 and um and 50 quid was a lot of money then and and um i didn't realize what 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 load of rubbish it was that he was selling me but, <laughs> but he, he sold me this guitar anyway in the amp. and and um and joe could, could joe was like the king of intros he would he could play an intro and he would, he would sit there and he would play an intro and he would, and I would say, God, that's brilliant, Joe, how'd you do that? So he would show me and then I'd say, right, okay, I've got that. What, what? He said, I don't know anymore. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> so he, he, he would play like the intro to Batman. You know? <laughs> 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 it go from there, he didn't know. And then uh, another way he, remember, he played me was the intro to What I Say, the Ray Charles song that Eddie Cochran did, and he played me that. I thought, oh, this is great, you know. So, so Joe would teach me an intro, then I'd go home and I'd learn the rest of the song. And then I'd come back and I'd play the rest of the song for him. And, and that was the way we did things. And, um, and it was great, really, because it really encouraged me to want to play. And that's when I found that I had a certain amount of natural ability when it came to the guitar, you know, so I could pick things up and, and play quite quickly by ear. But um, so yeah, that was the first time. And the next one, I think, was quite a nice one. It was um, um, an Antoria or something like that. Well, I thought it was a nice one anyway. And, and then uh, I had a Hondo, a, a blonde, semi-acoustic, single cutaway Hondo, which I thought was the bee's knees. It looked terrific. And I thought, oh, this is like the Scotty Moore guitar. You know, I've got a Scotty Moore guitar. And um, I remember um, I went out to, um, a guitar shop in Bedford to buy a Bigsby for it because it didn't have a Bigsby on it and I wanted a Bigsby and uh, so I bought this Bigsby and I took it home and I, I put it on the guitar myself and it was one of those, it didn't have a tail piece, it was one of those that kind of gets um, drilled into the body, screw into the body, you know. It wasn't the best thing to do, not, not on a guitar like that as I was to later find out because I put it on and then woke up the next morning and the guitar had bowed right in the <laughs> It looked like a banana. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, so the Hondo didn't last very long. And then, and then I, I, I was about 19 and I had a, a Ford console which I'd bought. And, um, and um, I sold that because I'd heard that Gretsch had, because uh, Gretsch had been out of business for, for a few years during the 80s. And um, uh, one of the, the relatives had bought the company back and decided to bring out a limited line of Gretsch guitars. I think there was a 6120 and they, I think they did a duo jet and maybe a white falcon, something like that. Um, and of course this was sort of late eighties so you didn't have the internet then. So you didn't know what you were buying really. You were just you were just told it was a Gretsch 6120. So I, I sold my console and 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 I, I managed to get enough money to buy this guitar. I, I seem to remember it was fifteen hundred pounds, which was an astonishing amount of money. Um, and um, and I bought this guitar and it turned up and and you know once you've got past 
how beautiful it looks. You, really, you could see the inaccuracies. It was not based on the mid fifty scratches. It was a brand new guitar, you know. So um, they had made it to suit, a, sort of, I guess, a modern market. Um, so it had filter trons on it, and, and uh, the, the G brand wasn't actually branded into the body. It was, it was a kind of a sticker that was under the lacquer. So there was a lot of inaccuracies with the way it looked. It had a black, uh, sorry, a red headstock with the horseshoe uh, logo, and I wanted one that was black with the steer heads logo as Eddie Cochran had. So it was there was a lot of things wrong with it as far as I was concerned, but it was still a beautiful, beautiful guitar, and it was worth every penny. And uh, and and uh, so once I bought that guitar, that's when I realised that I had to, you know, become a better player in order to justify owning it. So uh, so that's what I did, and. Uh, and I had that guitar up until about the late 90s when it got stolen. So, um, uh, so I never saw it again after that. But uh, beautiful guitar, really beautiful guitar. Uh, hello, Mr. Boyce. How are you? Yeah. Early on, you said picking comes easy to you. Yes. So, if it doesn't come easy to someone, the, the, the picking the fingers, have you got some suggested chord shapes and songs you could practice on? Yes. Um, yes, that's a good question, really, because. Um, I, I don't know when I first became aware of Mo Travis and Chet Atkins and people like that, but um, the basis of that style was definitely with, uh, I first heard with Scotty Moore on the obviously Sun Records. And the way Scotty Moore played that style was very, it wasn't as precise as, as, um, as Chet Atkins would have played it or Mo Travis. Um, so really what he was doing was he was doing, he was playing with a thumb pick Scotty Moore and he was using his fingers but it, it, it was more of a thud what he was doing on the bass strings as opposed to playing a, what, I guess what you'd call a syncopated uh, bass pattern, you know, a boom, 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 you know, that kind of a thing. He would, more, he would do more of a boom, dun, 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 that kind of a thing. And, and um, so I wanted to play like that, but I didn't want to play with a thumb pick because all the thumb picks that I tried, just all they did was they just turned my thumb blue and, and, and they were very painful, so I didn't, I didn't want to use a thumb pick. So um, I, I decided to just use the plectrum with, with using these two fingers and, and uh, just kept practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing hours and hours and hours every day, every day, every day, every day. And, and like anything, you start off very, very slowly, very, very slowly, and then you need to get your, the muscles in your, in your, you know, your brain tells your muscles exactly where to go. And once you've got your trained, you know, trained the brain, you know, it becomes natural, it becomes easy to do, but it takes a very, 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 very long time. Um, but it's, um, let me just show you a little guitar. Okay, so you know it, it works better in in the the major chords. So if you're playing an E. So it's working out the rhythm uh, in, in, you know, how you're going to play a song like that. So the easiest way to do it is just to, is just to play it uh, separately, you know, so play the bass parts first. And you're kind of dampening it down with your fingers here and even up here as well. trying to get that pinching movement going with your with your finger. See Mel Travis played with a thumb pick and that finger, so almost like a claw in action, you know? And it was Chet Atkins that came along and brought in the other fingers and played it almost like in a flamenco style, I guess you'd say, but uh, and, and and took the style on up another couple of levels, you know. But um, for rockabilly, um, it doesn't have to be as precise as that, you know? So so you're really just trying to get the rhythm uh, going with the bass strings and then bringing in 
a very simple pattern with the with your, your, your with the top strings, and I'm really just playing sevenths and sixths and things like that, uh, which are very very effective. Just all about the rhythm and 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 uh, just start off slowly and just work your way up into the speed of it. It's very hard to play slowly, actually. I'm really trying to do it. the neck, you know, so if you're playing in C, and that's where you just hear the, so it's more of a, of a, a rhythm thing that you're throwing in, it's not notes so much, you're not trying to make the notes ring out, you just want that thud going in behind what you're doing. describe it really because technically it's one of those things it's very hard to describe technically so it's a it's, uh, it's it's like um, it's a technique and and it's one of those things that you can you just have to sit and learn and uh, like took me years to really learn how to do it to the point where I can do it now because it's just second nature um, and because I didn't learn through a technical way like reading books or things like that I had to just sort of sit down and work out how to do it and it's one of those things you know, like your memory is like a is like a, a computer, isn't it? There's only so much. Well, certainly, there's only so much I can hold in my in my mind before things have to float away to make room for other things. You know, so I, I remember sort of sitting down and, and working out how to do it, but I can't remember, you know, the how I did it. If you see what I mean, it was just one of those things that just took an awful long time. But when it finally hits you, you never you never forget it, um, and it's the it's really the basis of everything, everything I do because when you're singing and, 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 and uh, playing at the same time, it's a great style to have because it really does flesh out the, the sound, especially if you're in a three-piece band like I'm used to playing in. So you can, it, it, it brings in the melody, you know, it makes it very melodic instead of doing, you know, for an hour and a half, you know, that gets a bit tedious even for me, you know, but if, if you can throw in songs where you're, where you can throw them in that style as well, it breaks it up, and so that's that's what that's how it's always worked for me. But um, yeah, it's it's very difficult style to to understand, and I think I, I did buy one of those. Um, does anyone remember the Mel Bay um, yeah. books that came out in the seventies? I think, and there was a there was a Mel Travis one, and I remember buying it, and I could not make head and tail of it. I mean, it was just all blibs and blobs, really. You know, I couldn't understand any of it, and and even though it it sounded like it was written for an idiot. I mean, I couldn't work it out for the life of me. I just thought, well, you know, I'm never going to be able to play as intricately as that. So, so um, I'm going to have to find my own way of doing it. And and there is a t technique. There is a, a term for this. It's called hy hybrid picking, and a lot of lot of players use it. And and it's it it it, it can help you uh, with speed and things like. That. It makes you sound like you're playing actually a lot faster than what you actually are because you're just you're flicking strings with your with your you're going down with the pick and up with your finger on the on the on the third string. When you when you throw that sort of thing into solos, it 
sounds like you're playing a lot more than actually really what you're doing. So, so it's a it's a handy technique to have, but it's all done with the with the with the with the fingernails. And uh, fortunately, just as I turned up today, I broke this fingernail, which uh, you know, without this fingernail, it's very difficult for me to play the guitar. So, uh, you know, you have to look after them and take plenty of zinc tablets, which I found. But I um, hope that answers your question in a long-winded way. But uh, it, uh, it is a technique, and it takes a long time to learn it. But it is, once you get it, it's fantastic. Thanks. Hi, Daryl. Um, I'm just trying to get my head around playing outside the confines of the spare room of rock. And um, just wondering how, like, how loud, like, take away the monitors and the PA system, and all the sound reinforcement. How loud are you playing on stage? What's a good volume for like a sort of a modest sized stage for your guitar? Well, I think you have to bear in mind what type of um, guitar you're playing for a start. I, I play a guitar that can howl a little bit if you're too close to it. So, you know, I try and keep the volume down as much as I can on stage, but I also feed off of the volume that I get. So, and I think that's very important because if you play too quietly, it's very difficult to get into, especially with the style of music that you know. Rockabilly is all about feel, and 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 so you, you know, you want to be able to to play at a certain volume, but you don't want to deafen everyone around you as well. So um, the great thing about the Delta Blues actually is one of the reasons why I chose that amp years ago was because I had ha up to that point I'd had a a 59 Fender basement reissue, which was uh, four tens and, and uh, a lovely amplifier, um, but it was, it, it just had one setting, which was like really loud, you know, to get any sort of, uh, uh, any sort of growl out of it, you had to turn it up really, really loud. And, and then um, I, I discovered, um, distortion pedals and, and I, I bought a, uh, a Marshall Blues Breaker in the uh, mid, mid 80s I believe and, and I quite liked that, that was quite good but it, I always felt it was a little bit unnatural, it was a little bit unnatural sounding so, um, so I, I stopped using it and then I found the Delta Blues which has got uh, the um, post and the pre and post thing, you know the distortion setting uh, and, and that was like a revelation to me because it meant then I could play at quieter um, volume but still get that grit out of it. I don't like too much distortion but just enough um, because you know it can cover quite a lot of um, you know a bit of sloppy playing every now and then you can sort of cover it up with a little bit of that and echo um, but but uh, it, it, it's a lovely amp to play at, at lower volumes but I think it's really whatever you're comfortable with, to be honest with you. And I think that, um, uh, you know, if I'm sitting down at home and I feel like picking the guitar up and playing along to some music, I've got one of those little uh, practice amps that, that has got a few little effects in it and things like that, and I find that adequate. Um, but for gigs, I mean, I bought the Delta Blues thinking that that was going to be good for smaller venues because it was um, it's only a 30 watt amp. But then I found that it, it can handle anything, and I've played all in front of five people, in front of five thousand people, thirty-five thousand people. Some of the festivals that I played at uh, with with Amelda, and and the amp could handle any of it, you know. So that's why I've always stuck with it. But but it's 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 whatever you feel comfortable with, really. But I think with it depends again on what type of guitar you're playing. Right? This is the sort of guitar that can that can you get a lot of feedback with, so you have to a little bit a little bit mindful of that, a bit careful. Hello, Darrell, are you alright, mate? Yeah. Uh, question I have to ask, please. Uh, from listening to your playing, you have a tremendous knack of getting to the heart of what a song needs. Um, do you have any particular like um, attitudes to approaching improvisation, say, just to you know cut the chaff and get straight to what the song desires and what you know forwards it, rather than you know uh, just playing for the sake of it? Yes, uh, yes. There's, well, you know, the thing about rockabilly music that always appealed to me was that first of all, um, it's usually a twelve-bar solo, and and um, so you were, 
you had to get it all in in 12 hours really you know you, you didn't have much time to to to, to uh, you know uh, improvise you know you just sort of but but of course when I started singing and, and playing and fronting the band um, I found and again I think that a lot of this was was uh, the influence of Brian Setzer who I think has been an absolutely incredible ambassador for rockabilly guitar playing and he's by far the best in the world I think by uh, everyone will agree with that I mean he's, he's a genius and but you know when he first came out with the Stray Cats they were so what I loved about them was their irreverence towards the music because you see back in the um, early 80s and in, in, almost throughout the 80s really when rockabilly was you know uh, like chart music in the early 80s there was bands having huge success with the music there was a club scene, a huge club scene, and bands were playing the music, and there was this thing where a band was judged by how well they could cover songs. And, and you know, if they played them absolutely note for note, people used to really appreciate that. Well, I could never understand that, you see. I couldn't understand the point of doing that. You know, so then a band like the Stray Cats come along, and Brian Setzer would throw a whatever he wanted it to any solo, and the solo would go on for five minutes if he wanted it to. And I thought, this is incredible, you know, this is absolutely wonderful. The attitude that he brought to the music was exactly what those guys had in the 50s, you know, but he just updated it and, and, and uh, made it, uh, uh, if you like, uh, valid to us teenagers then. Um, but he played any type of solo that he wanted to play, and, and that was liberating. You know, it was absolutely liberating. So, you know, when I, when I, I mean, I, I tried to learn how to play like Brian says, but it was just so far away above above what I was capable of doing that I, I never, I never uh, tried to learn how to play like him. But the influence that I took from him was to. Uh, to be your own player, you know, to find your own way of playing, your own style of playing, if you like, um, which is difficult within a, a genre like rockabilly because there's always certain guitar players that you're always going to sort of gravitate towards, whether it be Brian Setzer or Eddie Cochran or Cliff Gallup or Scotty Moore or Grady Martin, Carl Perkins, you know, there's there's any number of players that, that, that were all very distinctive. And that's another thing that... You know, when I was when I was younger, and I used to play along to records and everything. There was a Ricky Nelson album that I loved, and I used to play along to that all the time. And even then, I recognised there was two different styles of guitar playing going on. And, uh, and I found out later one was James Burton, and one was a guy called Joe Mavis. And I always loved the Joe Mavis uh, songs because I loved his his style of playing. And the other thing about um, uh, rockabilly playing in particular is that. What you, what you try and do, or what I always try and do, is, um, is always make the, the, the next solo more aggressive than the solo before. You know, so, so you know, the first solo you can make that quite nice and, and, uh, and everything, but the next solo has got to lift it up, it's got to lift the song. And if you're going to do another solo, then again, that's got to lift the song up as well. So, so that's how it works with, with Rockabilly, and that's how I like to play Rockabilly. Is, you know, I don't ever try and do five minute guitar solos, I can't do that. But I, but I, but I will do two or three solos, in, 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 you know, one after another, but they always have to be more exciting than the one before. Um, and, and it could be just chords, it could just be, you know, it's just whatever lifts the song, it's more, it's the song and what you want to do to the song and, 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 and the reaction that you want to get from the audience because rockabilly is that type of music where it's, it's quite aggressive really, you know, so, uh, but it's fun as well. It's, it's got a lot of fun to it. But um, but I think with with solos, you you've you've got you know the, the order. That, I mean, if there is an order, but you know you just the first solo, second solo, third solo. But that they've always got to each solo's got to lift the song, take it somewhere, you know, and then bring it back down when you come in to sing again. So that's how I approach it. I've always approached it that way. Junior, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, well, um, I think it's time to have a you know, ten minute break or something and then um, come back and do some more. But thanks for the, all the questions and uh, I'm going to have a quick uh, cigarette and then I'll come back. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Might have to start, start doing that one in the set. I quite enjoyed that one. Nice yeah. bouncy song. The next song I'm going to do uh, is the title track of, of uh, that album that I just mentioned, Hell's Hotel. So I'm going to give that one a go now. And uh, this is a kind of a an odd song, really, in many ways, because I've always had a fascination with the supernatural, as I think we all do at some point in our in our lives. But I've written a lot of songs on the subject over the years. And uh, this is a song which is really sort of inspired lyrically, I suppose, from um, Heartbreak Hotel, which is one of those sort of songs that when you first hear it, you know, you perhaps don't take too much notice of the the uh, lyrics and the story of the song, but it's a very dark song, Heartbreak Hotel, and uh, I've always loved that side of rock and roll, the dark side of it, the, the, where you can, you know, m make the lyrics a little bit more sort of uh, meaningful, if, if you like. So this is uh, a song called Hell's Hotel. Thank you. So that was quite a miserable song, as you could probably tell. And uh, but it's a, a song that I'm very proud of, and uh, and and uh, I'm glad I was able to do that one tonight. So, so springboarding from that one onto a very happy song, the next song is called "When You Smile," and again it was on Hell's Hotel, and it's a song that um, started off life as a ballad, uh, a very very slow ballad, and and not to name drop, but I will do. But I recorded this originally with Jeff Beck on guitar, would you believe? And, uh, and, and, and we played it as a ballad, a very, very, very slow ballad. And he had never heard the song before. And, and uh, when it came to the solo, he, he played this absolutely beautiful solo. It's unbelievable. And I, afterwards, I said to him, I can't believe you did that because you've never heard this song before. And you just played this most beautiful solo. And, and he didn't seem at all phased by it. <laughs> I suppose that's, that sort of separates the great from the good. Is uh, is uh, you know the, you know someone's a genius they they can just play anything can't they really but it was a real eye opener working with someone like that so um, to take it away from from a very slow song um, I wanted to record it uh, I've been listening to a lot of Fats Domino a few years back I've always been a big fan of Fats Domino but I've always loved his sort of bouncy style of playing you know with the chords and the guitar player used to play that sort of almost like a scar beat really I suppose you'd call it but um, so I decided to speed this song up and and turn it into uh, a, a, a very happy song really and 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 uh, it's uh, a song which I always sort of dedicate to my to my daughter because every time you know I see my daughter she's a little five-year-old thing that runs around and kicks people and bites people and things like that but she always makes me smile so I, I sort of dedicated this this song to her so this is called uh, When You Smile. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, another song off of that uh, same album. This is another sort of, um, well, sort of a miserable song, really, I suppose. It's, uh, I've disguised the misery of it by making it a little bit up tempo. So, uh, you know, you have to sort of uh, forgive me for this one. But this, uh, the reason why I like this song so much um, is, is that it's basically three chords. It's a three chord song, but it's just, I found a way of playing them in a slightly different order, which, which sort of interested me, but uh, might not interest anyone else, but interested me at the time. But this is a song called, uh, called Turn Around and Go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, a lot of uh, a lot of all of that stuff there that I'm doing on the guitar when you're singing is something I learned from listening to Carl Perkins records. Now, Carl Perkins was one of these artists that played uh, guitar and sang, as, it, as did Eddie Cochran, and they all had a kind of a similar way when they were singing. They uh, and but there was something that Carl Perkins used to do that I used to love when he was doing songs like. Uh, friends are barking the blues, it must be going round. All my friends are barking the blues, it must be going round. So he would do this sort of 
sort of emphasizing the, 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 the off beats and things like that. And I always think, oh, that's good, that's good, I like that, I'll throw that in somewhere. So we, when, when I play and sing, there's a lot of times when I do that sort of Cole Perkins thing, because it just fills out the sound a little bit more. And that's something that you want to do when you're playing and singing, is just sometimes find the most simplest things to do, but they're the most effective, you know? And, and, and uh, even when you're playing the chords, It's very, very, very simple, and that's that's good. So I'm going to do one more song, which is uh, probably my favourite rockabilly song. And a gentleman asked uh, uh, earlier on, actually, if, we, if I was going to do it tonight, and I do it on every gig. But it's a uh, it's a Johnny Bennett song called Rockabilly Boogie. So that's the one I want to do as the last one tonight. Yeah. And we'll do a bit more chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll roam around with some, uh, some more questions, but I'm just going to take a massive liberty and ask Daryl the first question, if that's all right. Um, any tips for tuning stability with Bigsby's? Oh, that's a good question. That, that took a long time to work that one out, because <laughs> uh, they are notorious for, for going out of tune. In fact, there's a great um, uh, CD that came out a few years back, <coughs> sorry, on... Uh, Rockstar Records, where Eddie Cochran was playing in, in uh, Australia on that very famous tour with Little Richard, where Little Richard went mental and threw his rings off the Sydney Harbour Bridge and found God and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And um, Eddie uh, is about to go on and play his song. He does a version of a whole lot of shaking going on, and he's using the Little Richard band to back him up. And he, he starts off by saying, I'd like to thank Johnny Meeks from the Gene Vincent band for lending me his guitar because I couldn't get mine in tune. And I thought, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. So the, the problem with the Gretches back then um, was that, uh, you know, um, you, you've got a floating bridge here, you see. There's a floating bridge. I don't know why I have a floating bridge. I mean, somebody might be able to explain to me afterwards why, but I don't see the point in it. But the first thing really you've got to do with the Bigsby is you've got to stick that down. I either pin it, which is what I do, I have little um, nails put in, and, and uh, so it doesn't move, because that can move from side to side, so you don't want that to move, because that will, that will affect the tuning. The other thing to do is where the, where the, um, the spring here is in, in the arm of, of the uh, guitar, uh, I put a bolt in there as well, so I screw that down into the body because you see that can move from side to side, and when that moves, that can move the bridge. You see, so if you stick those two things down, you get rid of a tremendous amount of tuning problems. And uh, another thing is an aluminium nut up here um, that that helps as well. You know, I've, I've found anyway. So those those two things, um, you know, pinning the bridge and bolting the big speed into into the body of the guitar. Of course, a lot of people aren't going to want to do that with a you know, an original guitar, but, you know, for, for these sort of guitars, it's fine. But you, you really need it to stay in tune, so that's what I do. Thank you. Right. Anybody? All right, Darrell. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question about Eddie? Yes. Seeing as you know him surgically, almost. <laughs> uh, back then in the early 60s, he'd done so much in the studios with so many people, recording-wise. Do you think he might have went down that Jerry Cole, Tommy Tedesco, or the whole record crew route, working with everybody in it back then? Yes, I, I think he would have done. I mean, interestingly enough, um, I went to America in 1992 and I worked with the Kelly Four, Eddie Cochran's last road band. And whilst I was in, uh, I was staying with the piano player, it was a guy called Jim Stivers. And Jim lived in a very small town called Anderson in Missouri. And, and it was right down in what they called the Tri-State area because it bordered um, Arkansas and, and um, somewhere else, I can't remember. But anyway, it was quite down south. And it had turned out that um, Jerry Capehart lived not more than 10 miles away from Jim. 
and the two of them had, had found each other by accident. Um, if you think about how vast America is, it was such a huge place, that, that Eddie Cochran's manager and piano player would end up living within 10 miles of one another in, in, in you know, the middle of nowhere. It's quite incredible. But anyway, um, Jim uh, took me to, to Jerry's... Uh, he lived in a, a, a mobile home in the middle of a forest, from what I remember. And he had this uh, studio, purpose-built studio. We did some recordings together there. Now, interestingly enough, um, on the floor by the by the um, the um, the tape recording machine, there was a a little reel, reel to reel little tape, like a seven-inch tape reel or something. And on there, it was it had written Glen Campbell, and and these were very early recordings that Jerry. Capehart had made with, with uh, Glenn Campbell whilst Eddie was over here in England because on the tape box he said March 1960. So what I think had happened was that Eddie and Jerry Capehart had gone their separate ways. Eddie was no longer, no longer considered Jerry Capehart to be his manager and Jerry had found Glenn Campbell and he was kind of, um, if you like, uh, doing working with him the way he worked with Eddie. So, so Ben Campbell was doing an awful lot of session work. He was working for the Champs and all sorts of people and making his own records as well. And I, and I think that's the direction that Eddie would have gone, very much so. I think he would have done a lot more studio, studio. I mean, he did an awful lot of studio work anyway. But you see, the thing to remember about Eddie Cochran was that his career was very fragmented. You know, he would have a hit record, then he wouldn't have a hit record for almost a year, and then he would have another hit record again. And I think he was one of those artists that always wouldn't have been a chart force um, for like a short period of time. I think he would have just, every so often he would have come up with the right song at the right time and would have had a hit with it, you know. So he would have had a career that would have lasted a very long um, time. And the other thing, that Eddie really enjoyed being a rock and roll star. He really, really enjoyed it. But he also enjoyed being a studio musician. So he had this kind of internal struggle going on where, on the one hand, he wanted to be seen as a musician and be taken very seriously, but he also liked getting up on stage and singing, you know, rock and roll songs and writing rock and roll songs. So um, he, he, he would have... I think he just would have carried on doing exactly what he had always done, you know, his career was very short, unfortunately, but the pattern, I think, was set quite early on, you know, he would have, he would have had a hit record every now and then, and then he would have gone off and worked in the studio, and uh, we don't know where he would have gone, but he, he, was, he was a huge influence, especially on the musicians that came out after him in the 60s, you know, and, uh, you know, there's that, that quote of Jimi Hendrix saying that he just wanted to his funeral, he didn't want the Beatles played or anyone like that, he just wanted a bit of Eddie Cochran and a bit of Muddy Waters or whoever he was. And, and so his, his influence went beyond rock and roll, beyond rockabilly, and, and uh, yeah, I think he would have been a great, uh, a great producer and, and working with other artists and things like that. I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. Uh, Darryl? Yes. If you was given the choice to play rockabilly guitar for the rest of your life, or sit with Eddie for an hour, what would you choose? <laughs> 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 oh, <that's it. laughs> um, I'm glad that weren't the first question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Do you know? I I don't. I don't know if it's good to meet your, your heroes, you know, I don't know if it's quite, if it's a good thing sometimes, you know, you want that sort of space, that bit of distance, you know. Um, I don't know what it, what it was about Eddie Cochran that appealed to me. Well, I think I do know because I'd heard Elvis first, but you see, Elvis was alive when I first heard Elvis, he was alive, and, and you could read about him in the newspapers and watch his films on the telly, he was alive. Eddie Cochran had died before I was born, so he was immediately up there with, you know, the Knights of the Round Table and King Arthur and all that. It was, was a myth, you know, he wasn't someone that had been alive whilst I was alive. So I couldn't relate to him in any way, shape or form. And, and 
and I felt terribly sad that he had died before, you know, I could meet him, or, or, or whatever, you know, but I mean, I, I just, I, I think sometimes it's best just to keep your distance a little bit, and I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that I would be disappointed if I met him, because I don't think I would be, but I've met people that I do admire, and I've been very disappointed, you know, and, and it's very hard to get over that sometimes, you know, it's very difficult. So, um, I think, from everything I've, I, I know of him and from the people that I'm, I, I've met that knew him very well, I get the impression he was a really, really lovely guy. So he wouldn't, I don't think he would have been a disappointment in that respect, but there's always that outside chance. And if you admire someone so much, you don't want that chance to, to rear its ugly head, really. So I think I'll just stick with playing rock, rockabilly guitar, really, for the rest of my life and hope that, you know, when, when, when I go, that there is somewhere else to go on to and I'll meet him. And, uh, and then, then I'll hopefully I won't be disappointed because I'll be in heaven and we'll all be happy and one thing another. So to answer your question, I think that's, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's my best answer, really. But that's a great question, thank you. Darryl, I've got another question. Oh, a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you take that, uh, some of those last recording sessions that Eddie did with Three Steps to Heaven particularly, they combined the first of Nashville's great rockabilly guitarists in Sonny Curtis with Eddie as one of California's great rockabilly guitarists. Have you any idea where that could have gone? Well, there's, and, and I also think that Eddie's, uh, the sound, the bass sound in particular on Eddie's records like something else, Come On Everybody, Summertime Blues, was also a precursor to that Nashville sound, that huge bottom end on the, on the bass. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, because the thing about Eddie Cochran is that you have to delve beyond the, the greatest hits to realise what a great guitar player he was. And I, it often amazes me when I hear songs that, and, and there's still songs popping up from time to time that could be Eddie playing, we don't really know, but you know, it sounds an awful lot like him. And the, he, was a, he was a chameleon, really. He was a, a guitar chameleon because he could play in lots of different styles. And certainly towards the end of his life, with some of the session work he was doing before he went to, uh, to before he came over to England, he he seemed to be experimenting quite a lot with not just how he was playing, but the sound that he was getting as well. I mean, Eddie Cochran's great strength and the song, the the, the great songs that we remember of Eddie Cochran, uh, uh, "Summertime Blues," uh, "Come On Everybody." I mean, there's not even you know, an electric guitar on those records, you know, it's, it's all rhythm and it's, and so he, he, that's another very important lesson that I learned from Eddie Cochran was that, you know, you just keep it simple, it's about the song, it's about the energy of the song and the lyrics and, and uh, it's the whole package, it's not just a great guitar solo, you know, which he was more than capable of doing, but on his own records it's like he, 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 uh, he didn't, he, he wasn't like a, What's the word? You know, he wasn't somebody that just blasted out guitar solos. I mean, when we found that that uh, when that first bit of um, the, when the town hall party was found, the the the, uh, the performance that he did on there, it's only about twenty minutes long, and he probably only does two guitar solos throughout the whole of that that twenty minute performance. Now, from a guitar player's point of view, you'd be very disappointed with that, and I was because I thought, oh, you know, I really want to hear you do your solos, you know, and watch you and see how you play and that kind of thing. But he just didn't seem to be that bothered about that side of things, you know. Um, it was all about the song and 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 uh, he seemed to be more interested in writing good lyrics and, and uh, coming up with, with songs that people really <laughs> liked. Um, and again, that shows that he was sort of the complete package, really, because he, he looked great, he was a great singer, but great, great guitar player, but he, well, he was a great uh, songwriter, a great lyricist, because I'm firmly convinced that he wrote the lyrics to, to his songs. You know, although it says Cochrane, Capar, and a lot of them, I, I've always believed that Eddie probably wrote 90% of them, you know, so um, I think that what he would have, what he could have done, we'll never know, but there wasn't anything, there's one thing I do know is that there's nothing on record that, sh that 
proves what a great guitar player he was. I don't think that he recorded anything that even even touches the sides of how great he really was as a player. And that's the thing that I find most um, sad about it all, really, is that we've got little bits and bobs, little solos here and little, little solos there, but there's nothing... And, and, and had he have lived into the era of, of the, the, the guitar hero, if you like, that came along not that long after he died, really. You know, if you think about it, it was only really five or six years before um, we had this new breed of musician, the, 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 the guitar hero, the, the, the gunslinger, you know, that would stand out there and play 20-minute you know, solos with distortion and, you know, violin fiddles and things like that, you know, I mean, it, it, maybe he could have done it, maybe, maybe he might have not wanted to do, done things like that, but he was more than capable of it, and we just hear little snatches every now and then, you know, with Eddie's blues and some of the instrumental stuff that he did, uh, it all points in the, re in the right direction, but I've no idea, I, I think he would have, he, he, he could have been whatever he wanted to be, really, if, he, if he'd have wanted to be a great producer, he'd have been a great producer, if he wanted to carry on with the songwriting or just concentrate on that, he'd have written great songs, I think he was just one of those sort of people, whatever he'd have turned his hand to, he'd have been brilliant, and maybe that was part of the problem with him, it was because he was so good at all so many different things, that he couldn't, you know, he couldn't concentrate on just the one thing. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's very interesting what he would have done uh, had he have lived, because obviously he would have done more uh, collaborations, and uh, it would have been, can you imagine him going over to Nashville in the early 60s and working with Jack Atkins and something like that? I mean, it just blows your mind what, what could have come out of all of that sort of thing. So, you know, to, to answer your question, I think I agree with you. I think he could have been anything he wanted to have been. Apparently we've got time for one more song. Mean and say, well, just show us how you would do a slow rockabilly blues. Well, could you do that? Well, blues is not really... You know, the, the, the funny thing about blues, or my understanding of it, because I wouldn't ever consider myself to be a blues player, but the similarities between blues and rockabilly are, are very similar because it's all based on feel. You know, and rockabilly is kind of is based on a swing beat, and it really works best to a swing beat. Um, so, so uh, you know, if I'm if if I'm playing to a swing beat, I can I can play on that all day. But there have been times in my career when I've worked with bands that that work off you know more that do more blues stuff. I did I, I work. <laughs> 